How's it going, everyone? Welcome to the On The Water podcast. I'm Kevin Blinkoff. I'm Jimmy Fee. And today we're going to get the podcast kicked off with some questions. So we've got some questions that have been sent in by our listeners. And uh, Jimmy's going to get us started right off. What do you got, Jimmy? Yeah, so this one came from Instagram. It's from at gbrown1228. And he asks, uh, why is it plugs like pencils and spooks are not nearly as effective at night? And so when he says pencils and spooks, he's talking top water plugs. So pencil poppers, you know, head and, head and style spooks, kind of walk the dog baits. And uh, they are generally not thought of as nighttime lures. Um, so do you agree, first of all, with the premise that those top water lures are less effective at night than during the day? I do. But I think it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have caught fish on pencil poppers at night, but it was when I heard, and, and this was a, uh, you, you might remember this, it was years ago, it was the middle of the night, about 2 a.m. I was out fishing and a school of, of bunker came in with bass on it blowing up on them and I couldn't reach them, but I had a pencil popper in the bag and I was able to reach that, uh, the fish with that and I texted you and I had an old flip phone. I mean, that's how far we're going back. And I was like, like major blitz. Uh, what what did I call it? I, I was uh, I was asleep and I woke up. I got the text message and there's nothing I can do. I mean, by the time I got there, it would have been over. So it was just sort of to let me know. But it was you had some name for it. It was like midnight blitz, black blitz, black it was blitz. black blitz, because midnight that's blitz bunker on you know, very excited, all caps. And that was one of the only times I can really remember catching bass on pencil poppers in the dark. Now, Black Blitz was something that I heard in North Carolina, a bluefish, uh, like bluefish one time pushed into the bays and were feeding throughout the night. And that's what they called, you know, a blitz that happens after dark. And uh, so anyhow, that's one of the only times I've really tried pencils at night, I think. And that's probably a situation where it was just a matter of landing something that far out that makes a splash and they're going to eat anything because they're feeding heavily on Menhaden or Bunker. And uh, so I don't know that it's, you know necessarily that the pencil was the best choice in that situation but you made it work um but i would you know it does seem like those top water lures they excel in the daytime and particularly like first light and last light but once it gets dark top water just doesn't seem to perform as well except for maybe a minnow plug crawled along the surface something that moves slowly and throws awake so so i'm gonna go ahead and say it you know my opinion on the subject I think striped bass feed differently at night than during the day. And so, um, like, you know, and then this goes for like, say for fishing, you know, I'm fish, if I'm fishing a soft plastic, for example, in the daytime, striped bass are looking for that sort of injured fleeing fish that's acting, you know, that bait that's acting like something's wrong with it. And so if I'm fishing a bait, whether it's soft plastic or anything else during the daytime, I want it to have an erratic action something like a spook that's zigzagging side to side, a pencil popper that's splashing on the surface, a soft plastic, I'm doing a lot of twitching action, changing directions, because they were, they're looking for that bait that sees them and knows it's there and can't escape. Whereas at nighttime, I think it's a lot more of stalking. It's sitting in one place, a striped bass is looking for something that they want the bait that doesn't know it's there. They're looking for, um, you know, the the blackfish, the bunker, whatever it is that that is swimming by that's not aware that it's about to get eaten. Yeah, I think it's, of some of the plugs that are most effective at night, and it is like, you know, a darter or a needlefish or a, or a you know, redfin crawling across the surface, a minnow plug crawling across the surface, and those have a much less erratic, less panicked action like a baitfish that is completely unsuspecting. So. Exactly. So it's like if you watch bass feeding on bunker in the daytime, if the bunker are looking calm and swimming in a circle, it's like they're ready to escape at any moment. They they know the bass are there and they're just acting calmly because, you know, they, they know they can get away. It's when they panic and they're dragged out of the school or something like that happens that all of a sudden the bass pounce on them. So, yeah, sometimes the same lures. Again, the soft plastic, I'll fish it differently. At night, it's a straight, slow, steady retrieve. Let the bass think it's sneaking up on it, stalking it and track it down. And so that's my theory. It's not so much that it's a top water as it is that you want a different action. So like, you know, like you're, you mentioned needlefish, a floating needlefish straight retrieve at night is a top water lure, but at night you're doing that straight retrieve. And so they will feed on top, but you need something with a different action, not really that pencil popper spook action. I think that's, uh, I think that pretty much answers the question there. So the reason that they're not as effective as night at night, our theory 
is that it's striped bass feed differently at night. And those the action of the pencils and the spooks are more effective for those bass that are looking to to tra- chase down and attack panicked fleeing bait fish. That was good. That was a good answer there. I feel very confident in our answer. Yeah, that's good. That was mostly you. I'll uh the next one is Rodrigo Corsani, uh, also from Instagram, and he asks, do you think striper regulations are already working, and do you think they are positively affecting other species? So we are, when he's talking about the striper regulations, I assume he means the new slot limit, relatively new slot limit. We're in our third season of that where in from New York to Maine, you can keep one striped bass between 28 and 35 inches. In New Jersey, it's between 28 and 38 inches. And uh, after three years of that, are they working? What do you think? I, I, th- I have to believe that they are working and that fewer fish are being harvested and obviously fewer large fish uh, because there's a slot limit for the first time are being harvested. So it's working and cutting back. The question is really, is it enough? And I don't think we know yet. Um, I think that it's, you know, my, my opinion is I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful it's working. I think it's great to see, you know, I, I'm just as a, you know, for one example, we, everybody talks about the Cape Cod canal and there was a period when the limit was two striped bass over 28 inches. And it was really common to see people coming off the canal with two large striped bass, two 30 pound fish to, you know, 20, 30 pound fish. And you just kind of had this feeling like this isn't good. This isn't sustainable. When it went to one fish, it was a little better. Now to not see those big fish coming out of the water, um, I think it'll have an effect. And then I also think there's a bigger effect in that it's raised awareness. Um, The fact that the population of striped bass is overfished and it's down, the fact that the regulations are stricter that let a lot of people know, hey, we need to be more careful with striped bass. So with those big fish, not only, you know, are people putting them all back now, but the fish that would have been put back anyway, fishermen seem to understand they need to be more careful with these fish. They need to do a better job releasing them. They need to make sure these fish survive. So I think it can have a really good effect just even beyond the fact that the regulations changed and that the mindset continues to change with striped bass fishermen. Yeah, that's a great answer. I don't really have much to, to add there. Um, anecdotally, I've talked to some captains, especially down uh, around New Jersey, where they think they're seeing more larger striped bass now. Um, I mean, we are in three years where until you get to Rhode Island, where there's a commercial fishery for striped bass and they can they can take uh, larger bass as part of the commercial fisheries in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, until you get to there, no stripers over 38 inches if it's New Jersey or 35 inches if it's New York and up have been taken. So that's that's a you know, that used to make up a big percentage of the fish that guys would catch, especially in the springtime and and, uh, and would keep. So, of course, and I think, you know, a lot of people know this, but if you don't, the, the big the biggest striped bass are female. Um, so when you get to those large striped bass, say over 36 inches, they're going to be almost all female. And the bigger they are. Um, the better they are at contributing to spawning. They produce more eggs. I think they're more likely to produce viable eggs. And so big female striped bass, really important for reproduction. And that's what's going to bring the fishery back. When these fish go into the Chesapeake, when they go into the Hudson River, um, to have successful spawns. We've got enough big female striped bass in the population now. More is obviously better. But we get the right conditions. They have a big spawn. We get a big year class. That's what's going to bring us out and, and bring us back to kind of the striper fishing that we remember of of 10 15 20 years ago get back to the population that we want and see the striper fishery improve there was a second part to that question though yeah the second part was do you think they positively meaning the striper regulations affect other species that's that's a little tougher to pinpoint um I, I don't know if, if what he's asking here is kind of like a trophic cascade type question. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the things about the wolves in Yellowstone where they reintroduced the wolves and pushed the elk to different places and they started grazing. And it, it had this, you know, having more of a predator enhanced the entire ecosystem. But I think they later proved that that wasn't even that there's true. There's always going to be effects that are tough to predict. But it seems if you look at what striped bass tend to prey on, I guess there is a chance if you have more striped bass they might eat a lot of lobsters and you have fewer lobsters. So that's one issue, but I don't think it's a big one. I think the most important thing right now, and we're seeing it everywhere, there's so much more menhaden. 
And so I think having more striped bass um, could eat more menhaden. But the, the thing is, more menhaden means more striped bass. Like I think it works more in the opposite direction. The other way that the regulation change could affect other fish species is through angler behavior. So not being able to keep striped bass outside of the slot, not being able to take home fillets. You're seeing a lot of people now saying, well, then I'm going to go and take black sea bass. So one of the things the regulations could do is increase pressure on black sea bass. Or other, to tog in the fall. Exactly. So people start to look to those fish um, for, for meat for the, for the table. So it could in some ways cause increased fishing pressure on other fish species. And that is something fishery managers always think about and always look at. I think we saw that cut towards stripers uh, years ago, a few years ago, when the fluke regulations became so restrictive in New York and New Jersey. I, it was a lot easier for, for fishermen to go catch a keeper striper, a big keeper striper, than it was to catch a, uh, a fluke with a 21-inch minimum size, I think was the high water mark there in New York. For a little bit so uh yeah there's always those interesting effects that it has on angler behavior which are really hard to predict i was i, I can think of last year especially around cape cod uh when tuna came in and there were a lot of small tuna fairly close there was a lot less pressure on striped bass because so many so many fishermen said all right well i'm not going to striper fish i'm going to go and chase these tuna you had more people than ever chasing bluefin tuna and less pressure on striped bass this year, you could see gas prices have a huge effect on angler behavior. You could see far fewer trips maybe um, out to fish for tuna, maybe fewer saltwater trips to fish for striped bass because people are just doing fewer trips and making making the most of the ones they do take. Um, and so, you know, it's tough to predict, but we can kind of see what comes out of this season. Yeah. No, 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 you're right. Uh and as of yet, I mean, we haven't seen those same, uh, right now we're recording this in mid-June, and we haven't seen those big schools of small tuna come in close yet. We're seeing some big tuna now, but uh, I'm hopeful for the small tuna. Those are my, uh, I, I'd much rather catch those um, than tangle with the big ones. But on to the next question. This one is from uh, Rennell Lodgers uh, on Instagram, and his question is, what's a good kayak rod set up for stripers, blues, and albies that won't break the bank? And I feel like I've been kicking all these questions to you, uh, you know, this week. But this is definitely your wheelhouse. You do a lot more kayak fishing for striped bass, bluefish, and false albacore than I do. So, uh, so you probably have a pretty good idea of that one. I, I think first of all, um, kayak fishing really—you don't really need to think anything specifically different from other types of fishing you do. The only exception would be a little more length in the rod can be helpful because you can clear the bow of your kayak. So if you're fighting a fish and it runs from one side to the other to make sure that it's long enough or that your arms are long enough that you can reach forward to clear the bow of the kayak, that's that's important. So is that length, you'd say maybe seven feet and up? I think for seven, six. all around spinning rod, uh, for doing all kinds of inshore fishing like that, I prefer a seven foot six rod. I wouldn't go really shorter than that in the kayak. And the other thing I like is... Um, a rod in the kayak that has a little more moderate action to it. So a super fast action rod, that means most of the flex is just in the tip. And in a kayak, you end up high sticking a fish, meaning it's inevitable. It's it inevitable. You're bringing that fish in close. You got to be careful and watch it. So a rod that has a little more bend throughout the blank, you're less likely to snap that rod when you're bringing that fish in close. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing that I would say in a kayak rod is good. And then there are some kayak specific rods out there made that will have, um, say maybe a place on there where you can leash them. If, you know, one thing I've always heard when you're kayak fishing, if you love it, leash it. Like at some point you will drop something, you know, you'll drop your rod and reel. It's just much easier to do from a kayak, or maybe you will even flip. We've all done that at some point. And so, you know, you, you want to make sure you've got a system, whatever your rod and reel is, if you love it, make sure you've got a leash for it. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't have too much to add. Kevin and I have pretty much our, our main Albi kayak rod is the same one. It's a G Loomis um, E6X inshore, and that's an eight foot rod. And that's a very, it casts well. It's got a moderate fast action, but it's very forgiving for some high sticking. And that's especially important with the Albies because you get them, they get in their circle right next to the kayak. And uh, you just need to lift that rod a little bit to get that last, you know, couple inches so you can get the tail of them finally. Yeah. The dangerous thing to do is choke up on the rod, let go of the, the handle and kind of choke your way up the blank in order to get to it. Because now you're sort of pinning that part. You're putting all the flex and everything above your above your hand. That's a quick way to break a rod. Um, so you just got to be a little bit careful of it. Be ready to grab grab the leader. 
Another thing which I never have on my kayak, but I've seen other kayakers do it, is having a landing net can be really helpful. So um, we were just fishing this this weekend. One of the guys from Old Town had a Bubba hand net that looked to me like I was like, okay, that that makes a lot of sense. It's a shorter handle net, work really well on the kayak, allows you to get under and scoop a fish, and you don't have to lift it out of the water, but you, it just allows you to corral that fish so you don't have to high stick the rod necessarily to bring it in. So, yeah, I watched. Uh, I saw that it was Ryan Lilly had that and. Uh that looked uh, that's something i think is going to go on my wish list but uh one thing we didn't answer was was types of rods that won't break the bank uh, like getting into some specifics we talked about length uh we talked about some of the uh specifications of those rods but st croix mojo was uh they they actually had a mojo yak a, a kayak specific rod but even if you didn't want to go that route with the the kayak specific one the mojo inshore uh that's a great kind of middle of the road price point uh for st croix that's a really good one and it's pretty durable uh, yeah i have a, i have too. a mojo inshore that i was fishing from my kayak just yesterday and i've had that rod for quite a few years it's really stays you know it's it's durable it's worked well and i think it's a great example of a lot of these lines like i think of st croix is they make premium rods a lot of these companies make premium rods and they also offer more affordable, you know, you could call lower end rods, but really more affordable rods. And as they've advanced their technology, this it trickles down. And so their basic rods, a good company that makes premium rods, look at their more basic intro level rods, and you'll still get some great technology there. There'll be some sort of, you know, you'll give up, you'll, it'll be maybe a heavier rod, um, but you're, you know, you're really not giving up that much. You've got some great options if you go with a reputable company and look at their entry level rods. That's great advice. So we've got one more question, and um, this one's from Thomas Maloli, also on Instagram. All these questions came from Instagram. I guess I should have said that up front. That's, and, but, and that's, a, a you know, submit questions to us on Instagram for the podcast. That's great. You can also email them to feedback at onthewater.com. And if you, you can type that, send that as an email, you can also do a voice recording, send us the voice recording, then we can play it during the podcast and people get to hear your actual voice. Yeah. So this question is, what are the best lures for striped bass in different weather conditions? Now, now this is something we could cover in a whole two hour podcast. I'm going to narrow down to one of my favorite lures in one specific set of weather conditions. And uh, maybe we can revisit this and talk about some more. But this would be uh, right now we've got a, it's really windy outside. You know, we've had some big surf. Strong currents because we're we are, are around the full moon, and in these conditions, I like the bottle plug. And uh, the bottle plug is a it's a swimming plug. It was designed by Stan Gibbs originally called the Casting Swimmer, and but the nickname the the widely accepted nickname for it is bottle plug because it does taper down. It has a wide fat back end of the plug, tapers down to a, a small neck, and then the end is kind of a scooped out lip. Um, it doesn't have a metal lip or a plastic lip like some other swimmers. The lip itself is carved into into the wood or, or if it's molded into plastic. And that plug, uh, Kevin once described it in an article as, as kind of the sledgehammer of uh, of your surf bag lures. Um, it is not a finesse plug. It is not a subtle presentation at all. It is a plug that is meant to cast far, dig into deep water, and it creates a ton of vibration. Uh, but there's nothing subtle about how you fish this plug. You cast it out. And, you know, I'll, I'll usually give it a good rip with the rod to get it to dig before I start my retrieve. And I'm retrieving it fast enough, so I'm feeling it thumping. And that could depend on the current uh, speed, how fast that retrieve actually is. But I want to feel the rod doing this, you know, giving me a good thump, good feedback that this lure is swimming. And, uh, you know, I'll mix in some pauses there. But it is a, a fantastic lure. It's been a great lure for you know, more than 50 years now, probably probably going on 75 years. I don't know the specifics of when Stan Gibbs designed uh, this lure, but it's caught tons of 50 pounders from New Jersey on up to uh, to Massachusetts here and probably and beyond. But you do want to fish it in big current, whether that current is generated from from rough seas and big waves, or whether it's an inlet or canal driven current. Um, but in, this is not going to be your best bet for calm water. Uh, you know, calm water, still water. Yeah, and I think, you know, as far as weather goes, you're really talking about how what's the effect on on you as a fisherman because of the wind, and then what's it doing to the water? How rough is the water? How bad is the chop? And, you know, if, if it's calm and nice, 
you can get away with almost anything. But in a, in a, you know, if it is flat calm, I'm going to throw a top water that moves with some subtlety, something like a walk the dog spook or something like that creates a little disturbance on the top, but not too much. If it gets rough and windy, um, then you can go and be, do something that's a little more aggressive, has a little more action, a little more splash to it. And then whether you're boat or surf, if you're dealing with wind, it makes it harder to feel the lure and feel the strike. So one of the things that a bottle plug does or any kind of lipped plug that swims, you want something that creates resistance against you in the water so that as you're retrieving it, it allows you to keep a straight, tight line to the lure. You can feel what the lure is doing. It, it, it negates that effect of the wind really blowing your line, lets you feel what that lure is doing, that it's a plug if it's swimming like that, and you feel the strike because your line stays tight. That's one of the toughest conditions I face in the surf is a crosswind. When you have a, a heavy crosswind that's putting a big bow in your line and you can't, one, it makes it harder to work the lure. You know, if you have a lure that's, that, that does require a more subtle presentation, you're just not going to get it. It's either going to come out of the water and skip across, or you're not going to have a feel for it. But the bottle plug, that that big lip is going to dig in. It's going to hold its place in the current, and you're going to be able to feel it even through that bow in the line. And it, as a result, you're going to feel that strike when a fish comes up and, uh, and eats it. So. so we talked a little bit about kayak fishing here. We're going to talk a lot more about it with our guests this week, who are Ryan Lilly and Greg Bennett from Old Town Kayaks and Canoes. Kevin sat down with them after a great week of fishing here on Cape Cod. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And if you have those questions, send them to feedback at On The Water, and we will answer them here on the uh, next podcast. The On The Water podcast is brought to you by Guidesly. Are you looking to book a fishing trip with a renowned hand-selected expert in the field? Guidesly has the best guides in the best destinations. Whether you've never fished before or you're a regular on the water, let Guidesly hook you up with the best captains in your area. They'll put you on the best catches of your life. You can search and book your dream trip now on guidesly.com or download their app, Guidesly Fishing Trips. Book a Guidesly trip today and create memories that will last a lifetime. All right. How's it going, everyone? Kevin Blinkoff with On the Water here. And today I've got two guests with us on the podcast. I've got Ryan Lilly, brand evangelist with Old Town Canoe and Kayak. And we've got pro staffer Greg Bennett, who came down from Maine to fish with us this week and agreed to sit in on the podcast and chat with us. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with you, Ryan. You're the brand evangelist for Old Town Canoe and Kayak. So evangelize a bit. Tell us a little bit about the Old Town brand. What is special about Old Town and what do you guys do? Yeah, so Old Town is based in Maine. Uh, we've been in existence since 1898. Um, so, you know, we were founded on the, sh the shores of the Penobscot River up in the greater Bangor area in, in Old Town. Um, what's really cool about our, our history is, um, you know, Old Town was a logging community and, and life was spent on water, both re recreationally and for work. So um, watercraft was a necessity. So it's just always been in our DNA to make high quality watercraft. And um, we've always been always been really innovative. Um, we innovated the, from the birch bark canoe to wood canvas. That was kind of our claim to fame as we made a uh, wood canvas canoe in the beginning. And here we are today. Um, you know, motoring around Buzzards Bay in a motorized kayak that's rigged out with thousands of dollars of electronics on it. And uh, it's basically a mini um, skiff at this point. So, yeah, a lot of changes through the history of Old Town. I think probably, you know, there's probably maybe half the audience knows Old Town as that is the classic canoe. The Old Town canoe is, I mean, it's synonymous almost with canoe. Yeah. But then there's another half of the audience probably that was introduced to Old Town in kind of recent years as the fishing kayak. What, what spurred that change? What, how did you, why, why did you guys go from being makers of really classic canoes to making really high-end and high-tech uh, fishing kayaks? Yeah, I mean, you know, innovation's always driven our company um, and being, you know, a company full of uh, people who love to be out on the water and who love to fish. It's a passion of ours and we're users of our own product. So that's uh, part of it. Uh, but we saw the trend about, you know, 12, 15 years ago or so where people wanted to access new and different waters, maybe didn't want the um, pain of the, the maintenance that a normal boat um, has or the, the challenges of storage and transportation. And so we saw this trend, um, this opportunity to position our brand, which is known for good quality product 
and to push it into this space of uh, high end fishing craft. And just in the last four or five years, you know, it, it has blown up even more, especially since, uh, you know, back in 2016, we launched a, our first pedal ever, our ever pedal drive kayak. And that really started our, our tailwinds. And from there, you know, introducing um, several models of pedal drive kayaks. And then in 2020, we, uh, right before COVID hit, we launched a new line of kayaks called the Old Town Sportsman line, which featured pedal paddle and power featuring an integrated Minn Kota uh, motor with spot lock. So um, all of those things really um, kind of happened serendipitously with just people and anglers wanting to get out there in a high end, but small uh, fishing craft. So, you know, it's not just people who can't afford boats. It's people that own boats, but want to access different and new places um, or want to go, you know, down a dirt road that they can't haul their boat down or access a hand carry pond that they can't get a boat into. So there are a lot of anglers, whether you own a boat or not, see the opportunities to and it just it opens up so much more for you. Yeah. Greg and I were talking about that yesterday, that he owns a bass boat, um, but he's out two or three times a week in his old town, at least. Um, Greg, let's jump to you. Tell us a little bit about your background in kayak fishing. When did you get into it? And then what is it about kayak fishing that you love so much that has you out in your kayak rather than in your bass boat? Yep. So I probably started bass fishing when I was younger. Uh, grew up in Maryland um, and fished in the, the local pond where we lived in the neighborhood. Uh, then kind of grew, went to college and kind of got away from fishing. I honestly didn't get back into fishing until probably 2017, 2018, when I met some friends um, and found out they had a boat on um, a lake up in Maine and I've never fished out of a boat at wow. that point huh. so it was always shore fishing so i went out absolutely fell back in love with it um then had the opportunity to go out in a kayak and fish from there that was even in my mind better because i was able to access more places than i wouldn't have been able to uh in a bass boat so um the glove for fishing out of a kayak just grew from there mm -hmm. what's your favorite i assume it's an old town but what's your favorite of the old town boats which one do you like to fish from um to be honest, they all have their special place. I have an autopilot, uh, 136. I have a Discovery Solo. Um, and both of those are probably my top right now. Obviously, um, they're both very different. Uh, but in the smaller ponds, I love to get out in my Discovery Solo. I can just paddle everywhere in like six inches of water and just get to where I need to to fish for bass. Um, and, and that boat is Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong here. That's kind of like almost a canoe kayak hybrid. How yeah. It's a, it's a it? hybrid craft. So it's a, it's a canoe hull with a kayak seat and you paddle it. You can paddle it with either a canoe paddle or a kayak paddle, but with this craft, it's, it's most efficiently paddled with a kayak paddle. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, you know, that's a boat that you'll take out, uh, Early. I can take it out because it's light. I can carry it if I need to walk into a place. I don't have to rely on uh, backing my truck or trailer down a boat ramp um, or even having a, a cart to drag it through. I can literally carry it with me over my shoulder to where I need to go to put in. Um, the other boat, the autopilot, absolutely love because I can kind of like Ryan mentioned before, spot lock. Spot lock is, is key on that boat. And if I'm fighting um, currents or um, I just want to stay in a particular spot, um, I just hit, hit the button and I'm good to go. Yeah, we joke a lot. Uh, we joke around here about the fact that so many companies come out with new products and they, they, they tout every, every new product is like, this is a game changer. This will change the way you fish, whether it's, you know, it's a new hook or line or whatever. And most of the time you're like, yeah, sure, it's a game changer or whatever the spot lock ability um, with the Minn Kota trolling motor, whether it's on a boat or on a kayak, being able to use it as like a GPS virtual anchor where what's going on there is the Minn Kota motor is keeping you in a spot. It's adjusting itself. So without having to drop anchor, it's just putting you in a place that has really changed the game. Yeah. It's changed the way people fish in saltwater from boats. And it's really changed what you can do with a kayak. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point, um, the spot lock technology had been around for years. That's, that's that's nothing new, but bringing it to the kayak and fully integrating it into the experience was what uh, really uh, set us apart from what 
what's going on. We're the first to do that. I mean, there's a, kayakers out there that um, are trying to figure out DIY ways to affix a, a aftermarket motor or a bow mounted motor to their kayak. You know, we're sister companies with Minn Kota and Humminbird. So we worked with them uh, in their engineering team to integrate that motor into the, into the platform. So it, I mean, it, it's not in the way it uh, functions the way it should. Um, and because we collaborated with them, it, it's honestly like a, a glove in hand sort of relationship. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thinking about it today, I mean, I was loving the pedal drive, but we, we had a, what, like a 15 knot wind in, in our face and, uh, you know, we are having to constantly pedal to keep our, our spot while we're jigging for, uh, for black sea bass. Um, those are the days that I'm like, man, I wish I had, you know, my, my autopilot. So I could beep. Yeah. We were out yesterday fishing on the Connecticut river and Matt stone, who's one of your pro staffers in the Connecticut area. He had his autopilot out there and, um, it's full. It was full moon tides outgoing. It was ripping. We had a wind in the opposite direction. He was joking. It was kind of like whitewater rafting when we first got out there, but, uh, we're all kind of jealous watching him using the, uh, the, the Minn Kota and spot locking, keeping and staying in place. And he also, uh, just this spring using that feature and using the spot lock, he managed to catch, uh, what I think is as far as I know, the biggest blackfish or tatog that I've ever heard of caught from a kayak. Uh, and nobody has stepped up and said they've had a bigger one, but I believe it's 23 pounds, yeah. which is, that is a big fish. Close to state record, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that is from a boat on a chart. I mean, that is a fish of a lifetime when you talk about, about blackfish or tatog to do it from a kayak is cool. And I think that really speaks a lot to the platform that that boat provides. Yeah. Um, so transitioning there to this week, you guys came down from Maine, uh, came down on Monday night. We got up early Tuesday and we got out there and Greg, this was, you know, I don't think it was your first time on saltwater fishing, but it was your it was first not time. My first time here. saltwater fishing, but yes, definitely in a, uh, I should say, yes, it was in a kayak. My first time saltwater fishing and targeting striper at that too. So it was, uh, so tell us a little bit about those, the first 20 minutes of, uh, striper fishing up here on Cape Cod. Well, it was just completely eye opening for me. Um, from just like, like you say, the first 20 minutes, you, you basically fish for live bait. Um, that was eye opening because I didn't know that's exactly how you guys typically fish for, for bunker or, um, yeah, we went out in there um, right off the launch right away, saw a pot of bunker uh, or, you know, what we call menhaden, also called pogies, and was able to get snagging hooks, you know, using a weighted treble hook and snag a bait and, and hand that to you. Yep. Yep. And so, I mean, within five seconds of it being in the water, you kind of kind of tell me exactly, OK, let the line go. And it's swimming around um, and then not even 30 seconds wham uh you see the fish jump and and you kind of keep your eye on it but obviously it's, it's doing a little bit of pulling a little bit of drag and then wham again and next thing you know um it was hooked onto a, a striped bass and that was just exhilarating like just the feeling of having um uh, seeing the action knowing that uh that the big fish is under distress and, and trying to get away um and a striper chasing it and then setting the hook uh, and reeling them in. Obviously, it, stripers are big fish. Yeah. Uh, I was pulling drag. And, and that, that was a good fish, too, for a first striped bass. A lot yeah. of people start off with a smaller fish, a schoolie. They had, go right into a slot size fish big enough to eat a, you know, a two-pound bunker is, is a pretty cool not way to 25 start. 25 yards from where he launched. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was, it I was, was telling was you, awesome. like, it's not always this easy. Don't be spoiled. <laughs> Um, but the way you describe that too, uh, a lot of people think, um, you know, in terms of bait fishing can be boring, but definitely not when you're fishing a live bait like that for striped bass. And especially even from a kayak where you're down low and you're yeah. pretty close to the action. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you got to kind of experience striper fishing in that way and, and break into it in that way. Yeah, no, it's just, it, every time you get out, you, you try to find a opportunity or, or something to learn. And that I took so much away from that. Um, and we even went out today by ourselves, uh, did the same exact thing and caught one, caught two actually. Yeah. So, um, I also say thank you for that. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it's always great to show people kind of like your home waters, see them enjoy it and see them have a good time out there. I also appreciated watching you fish cause I can see you're someone who is passionate about fish and learn, fishing and learning new techniques and like watching the way you approach the, the black sea bass fishing. 
uh, and seeing you kind of figuring out and learning it on your own, doing it your own way. I mean, you were fishing, um, I believe it was a bucktail jig with, with a, a trailer on it and, and kind of swimming it and moving along the bottom. And I could see like, oh, he's, he's got freshwater experience. Like he's fishing it the way I would fish a jig for, for a largemouth bass. But I saw it start working for you. You know, the sea bass are hitting it, they're working it. You start switching and trying new things. To see that, you know, as an, as an angler, um, watching you kind of figure it out and take your own spin on a fishery is pretty cool. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. The On the Water podcast is brought to you by Guidesly. Hey, charter captains, are you tired of pouring all your money and time into all the stuff that comes with running a charter business other than the actual fishing? Guidesly gets it. That's why they created Guidesly. Guidesly is built for guides, and they understand and solve the unique challenges that you face every day. Let Guidesly handle your book of business from technology to customer management, leaving you to handle the fishing. Become a guide on Guidesly.com and download the Guidesly Pro app today. Focus on what you do best, putting customers on the fish, and leave the rest for Guidesly to handle. And Ryan, this was, um, I think this was the second or maybe third year in a row that yeah. you've come down here year to fish with three. us. Year number three. Year number three. You're number three. Um, tell me how you feel about the Cape Cod saltwater fishery. Honestly, I get to fish in some pretty extraordinary places. I'm fortunate in that way. Just the job affords me to do it. Um, this is one of my favorite trips of the year, to be honest. Um, I was I, talking it up to Greg. Uh, I was really excited to invite him down, just knowing that he hadn't caught a striper yet. I figured this was the right place to you know, to, to, to kick off that experience for him. Um, what I love about it is, uh, the community, honestly, the community down here, um, you know, you guys obviously are wonderful hosts and, um, have, uh, done a good job of, uh, showing me the ropes down here, but just the greater community, you know, rolling up to other boats and, to, and, and sharing information and, um, you know, sharing the stories and it, it's just a, it's a really great vibe down here. Um, and, uh, I was just telling him, I was like, man, I could live down here. This is, you guys have a good thing going down here. I won't, don't worry. I know all you locals. Um, but, uh, I love it. I, I love, uh, just how unique the fishery is. I mean, whether, you know, we're fishing Barnstable, um, you know, uh, yeah, we took you out the South. Yep, yeah, that was really cool. But every every spot we gone, we've we've gone is uh, completely unique, mm -hmm. um, and offers something different. And uh, you know, today we we wanted to go back to where we went on day one because we felt like we could kind of cross off a bunch of different species, and we did. You know, we went there today and caught the striper, caught a, a sea bass, uh, caught some fluke. So um, that's what's just great about down here is a yeah, you, lot of opportunity. You, yesterday you Fish, yeah. Kind of a rare catch. I'll, I'll report back. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, you could use your imagination um, with where we're at with with autopilot and pedal drive. Um, that's the that's what's that's what anglers want right now. They want their hands free to fish mm -hmm. and to focus on the pursuit that brings them out under the water in the first place. They don't really want to deal with a paddle. Um, and so, you know, you could expect to see innovation within propulsion um, and, uh, you know, just thinking through how to make the angling experience just the best uh it can be um so you know we went leaps and bounds ahead of the competition with the autopilot um with what we're doing with our pedal drives and it being uh, instant forward and reverse you know maintenance free great salt water drive that's not gonna break down on you um you know you can expect a lot of innovation on the high-end fishing stuff um, so it's super exciting for me as a, a passionate angler should be super exciting for you. Um, so the sportsman line is super hot right now. That's, that's our, that's our prim, premier, uh, fishing line. Uh, you can get anything from, from paddle to pedal to, to motorized. And, uh, we've got, uh, about seven mile models in that lineup and uh, a lot of great, uh, retailers in new England, like black hall outfitters or goose hummock or kittery trading posts that sell, 
the sportsman line. So check it out. You know, a lot of those places offer demos too. So if you want to try it out, definitely highly recommend a demo. I have, uh, I get the question a lot. People ask me, you know, um, which kayak should I get? Which one am I going to like? And I always tell people the same thing. Like it's different for everybody. Think about the way you fish and then go do a demo. That's, you know, all of these places, uh, most of them are locally located near the water, offer those demos. The other thing is I know once these people get into a kayak and start pedaling around or, or whichever one, if it's paddle and they feel, you know, once they get over, if they've never done it before, they're, they're always concerned. Is it, is it tippy? Am I going to feel stable? And you get in one and you're like, oh, this is secure. And then you realize like, oh, I'm, I, I'm low to the water and I can like, it feels like you're more part of what's going on, part of the fishing. Um, at least that's why I love it. So I tell people, do those demos, try it out. And cause I just want to see more people fall in love with kayak fishing. Like I have, you know, I, like you said, I get to do lots of great fishing too. go, go cool places and do cool things. But kayak fishing remains such a passion for me because it is, there's just something special about it. I try and explain it to people, but it really comes down to like, you just got to go do yeah. it. And it's such a tailored experience. You can buy your kayak and then customize it for however you want to fish and whether you want to put a live well on it, you want to run fish finder screens. I mean, I've got a, a 360 hummingbird, um, and, and dual screens on my, on my boat back home. So, you know, you can do some pretty crazy things to it, just depending on what you want to fish for. Um, um, and to, to your point, I mean, you're in the fishing action. I mean, I love fishing from a boat cause you, you've got just great visibility and you got room to move around, but there's just something about just the intimate connection you have with the water. You feel like you're in the blow up when, when the, when the fish, uh, smacks your top water, you feel like you're in it. And, uh, you know, the bait that we were, that we found ourselves in a bunch of bait pods yesterday, we were surrounded by bait, literally yeah. slapping the side of our kayak. You were able to reach in and, and touch the bait. You're just so connected with, uh, with, uh, your experience out there. It's just a really special thing. So yeah, get out and find the model that's right for you. I mean, Greg kind of talked about how he's got a quiver and so do I, you know, I've got a pedal drive cause there's times that I, I want to pedal. I don't want to haul a, a battery around a bunch of electronics. Um, there's times that I want to paddle like when i'm waterfowl hunting I, I have the discovery solo for when i'm waterfowl hunting and then i got my autopilot for for bass fishing and for when i'm fishing the tidal mouths um for stripers up in maine uh you know i got a four or five knot tide outgoing and i can hit spot lock and and uh totally uh, pick apart uh a rip and and catch a bunch of stripers without having to exert myself so there's just a, so there's something for everybody and it's a totally customizable thing so just if you're thinking about it just be careful because you're going to open pandora's <laughs> box and spend a bunch of money on not just the kayak but all of the uh the stuff that go along with it yeah yeah there's a model for everybody and there might be more than one model for everybody like you were saying do a little duck hunting in one fresh water in one another one for salt water yeah so couldn't have said it better. Thank you guys for coming down again. Ryan Lilly of Old Town Canoe and Kayak and pro staffer Greg Bennett. It's been a lot of fun getting to know you guys and fishing with you, Greg. It was great to meet you this week and see you uh, cross off that striped bass off the Likewise. life list. Thank Very you. Very cool. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for coming down, guys. Have a safe trip back up to Maine. Thank you. We'll do. Thanks.